Eva, is there an Eva? I really shouldn't yell, I have a sore throat. Eva, is there an Eva? So in preparation for today, I did a little research. I went over to City Hall to see if I could figure anything out about Mr. Murphy. Oh, nicely done. And combining the records of the annual census that the city of Cambridge takes the residents and some voter registration records, I found somebody who may have been our actual Mr. Murphy. His first name was Grover, and this was long before the, the talking frog. Wait, wait, what was his first name? Grover. Grover? Grover, like the talking Grover frog. Grover Murphy. His full name actually was Grover Fergus Liam Mustafa Seamus Murphy. No. Really? I'm oh, sorry, I forgot. We've begun. Have it oh, we're going to have a musical rendition? Oh, lovely. Oh, no, I have to finish writing my song. Never mind. Can we erase that? I said, never mind. And so Grover remembers his first name, Fergus Liam Mustafa Seamus Murphy. The records indicate that he appears he moved into the house in 1968. And on the Cambridge census, every year it asks you your profession. And that changed every year, just about every year for Grover. It included electrician, plumber, carpenter, phrenologist, <laughs> I'm gonna sneak in. Rabbi. Rabbi. <laughs> he changed his party affiliation several times. He moved from Democrat to Republican in the year of the, the 1968, the year of the Nixon election. Then moved back to back to Democrat, and then later to Socialist. A socialist phrenologist. A socialist phrenologist rabbi. That's exactly right. <laughs> So I have a couple, of, uh, first of all, an MIT grad student named Irv, uh -oh. whose most prominent feature was Irv. He set up a chapter of Pi Kappa Alpha, and there, and there are no more good words that rhyme with Irv. <laughs> he had the nerve, yes. Uh, there are a Thank few, you too. Just, with the set up a chapter of Pi Kappa I should have done that. Thank you. The front room at 69 Chestnut, where the, where the view of the street was the best, but Pi Kappa Alpha moved in to no, to one man's chagrin, and now all of you know the truth. The rest, but one more, I'll subject you only one. The recalcitrant, the recalcitrant rumor was Murph. We've heard he resembled the Smurf, he much rhymes with Murph. <laughs> the peak, the Pika boys took over and said goodbye to Grover, but he said, no way, this is my turn. And now, and now let's hear the truth. Who wants to start by telling the truth of what, how the name Murph Where's got? our third judge? Well, the judges are Irv, TJ, oh, and there's Will. And there's Will, okay, good. So let's hear some stories. The undergrads, are there any undergrads here? Yeah, we have to go backwards in time, don't we? That we were undergrads, it's true. Uh, but, no, but I can start with the current grads and go backwards. Well, that would be a good idea. So every time I come out here, people, undergrads say, oh, you were here in the 70s. You know the real story of the Murph? Well, get them out here. I don't get think we, I don't think they know we're out here and that we've begun. Would somebody do the, somebody with a loud voice. Where's Jeff? <laughs> hey! <laughs> Somebody drag the undergrads out here. I came out here twice during the last month to, or two to remind people that there was going to be a Murph story slam. And now they're not here. Where are they? One more. Story. Right? By the way, if you, like, if you like stories, there's an open storytelling every Tuesday night in Central Square. Really? Where? Um, in Central is it Square in the bookstore? Right yes. Which? There's a there's an old fashioned used bookstore in the Central Square. Oh, uh, yeah. I can't remember the name of it now. So, do we have any undergrads who yes. want to tell the story of the Murph as they've learned it? You look like an undergrad, or maybe younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you. Come tell the story, even if you've never heard it. <laughs> Come on, Murph stories. Murph stories. Who can tell the story of the Murph stories? Yeah. You get to share them. Yeah. Who, Will, who was it who told it uh, to us last time? Hey, Steve. 
Go gather some undergrads for the story slam. All right, we have our first volunteer. Our first one coming up. Undergrads telling the story of the Murph, come tell us the truth. You know the truth. The living truth. The, the dynamic truth. truth. There, there we go. The changing truth. Start okay. with your name and year. My name is Jade Philippe. What is it? Jade. Jade, Jade, that's right. Hi, Jade. I'm uh, 2017, so I'm graduating this year. Yay! Yay! Yeah. That's a plan, anyway, right? Yeah, that's a plan. <laughs> Ideally. Still early. If like I manage to write this paper. Uh, but anyway. Once upon a time, there was a group of folks, and they decided they wanted a house together. And it looked a lot less sketchy for them to get a house together if they pretended they were a fraternity. So they pretended they were a fraternity. But <laughs> well, that's kind of another story. <laughs> anyway, they ended up with this house, and they wanted to buy this and make it their frat house. Uh, because frats need a frat house in order to have wild drinking parties. And Did you have wild drinking parties? Yeah. I want the truth. I want to know if any other guys can drink. Well, <laughs> at, you you at, want the ugly truth. Yeah. At the time, you this ugly was a boarding house. About. And there's a man in the boarding house by the name of Mr. Murphy. Grover Murphy. Yes, by the name of Grover Murphy. Okay. No, we got but Mr. Murphy. What did, what did and Mr. Murphy. What? what did you think his first name was? Mr. Murph, 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 yeah. Murph Murphy. Murph Murphy. Yeah, here, up here. But anyway, I'm telling the story. So this is Murph Murphy, and Murph Murphy lived in the the living room, what we now call the Murph. And this was the fanciest wow. room in the house because it had these nice bay windows looking under the street. And Mr. Murphy was very happy in his room. He liked it a lot. He had an armchair that was sat right under the bay windows, and he would leave the door open, sipping tea, and just watch people go by, and sometimes yell at them a little. But mostly just sit there sipping tea. Were these people on the street or people no, in like the house? No, like people in the house. Like he would okay. leave the door to the house open and like people would walk by and he would sort of har harass them sometimes. And Mr. Murphy had a rare um, speech disorder in which his vocabulary was limited to the words you and fuck, usually in the other order. Oh! Um, so, uh, sorry for the children. Um, <laughs> just, you mean you're sorry the children are... Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so, it, so he was a bit of an irascible character, and he wasn't particularly happy when he heard that a bunch of frat boys were moving into his house. And, uh, you know, because of squatter's rights, it was kind of complicated to remove him as long as he kept paying his rent. But the frat boys sort of, like, knocked on his door and said, Hey, uh, Mr. Murphy, uh, we're gonna move in here, and it'd be kind of awkward if you just stuck around, so, you know, do you want, like, help finding a place, maybe, or, like, you know, maybe, maybe move? And... He just said, fuck you. And then, um, so he the but the Pikins were not so, very confrontational. So, so far it's all true. <laughs> the Pikins didn't feel very confrontational, so they were like, I'm sure he'll be reasonable and move out. Like, he's just being grumpy about it, and he has every right to be grumpy, honestly, but we don't need to make a big deal with this. Then it becomes, like, a couple days before they're supposed to move in, and everybody else has moved out. But Mr. Murphy is still sitting there, none of his stuff packed, clearly has no intention of moving out. Uh, and so they knock on his door and they say, Mr. Murphy, uh, you know, we're, we're going to move in in a couple days. I'd like to get out. And Mr. Murphy says, fuck you. And they're like, okay, I'm sure he gets it. I'm sure he gets it now. So they, but they, again, they're not very confrontational. So they just like, um, and then they all start to move in. And Mr. And when they, on the day they come to move in, the Murph is boarded up from the inside. And they're, at this point, they start to get really worried because there's like no food in there, no water, no bathroom. This is kind of concerning. Uh, and like the doors boarded up, the windows are boarded up. They have no idea if he's still in there or what's going on. They're like, okay, it would be a little too rude of us to like break down the door. He might like panic. Notice only um, a little too. <laughs> yeah, it's a little too rude. So what we have to do, we have to make sure like he knows we've moved in and will like decide on his own to leave by throwing a loud and obnoxious fake party. So they invited all their friends, and they had a loud and obnoxious fake party. But Mr. Murphy didn't come out and didn't say anything, and they're like, oh god, he's dead in there. So, there was only one more thing to do. They had to have, they had to break the boards in a way that looked like an accident. So they got a freshman and an upperclassman, like one of the big burly upperclassmen, like a kind of skinny freshman. They wrapped the freshman in bubble wrap, alright? And they staged a fake fight. So the upperclassman said, hey, I don't like your shirt! And the, uh, and the freshman said, hey, I don't like your face. And he sort of like made some slapping noises like this. And then 
the upperclassmen threw the freshmen through the boards. So it looked like an accident, right? And as the dust settled and the light filtered into the room, they could see that the room was entirely empty. No furniture, no people, except for a typewriter that was missing the letter Q. That's the work All right, so far Jade's the winner. It was prehistoric oh, bubble wrap. Oh, oh, what shirt is that? Can I see the like a shirt? Yeah, this is the Pegasus shirt. Now do we have a dance interpretation? <laughs> That's kind of like a volunteer right there. I should tell you what is the vortex happening in the book for everything? Stories, stories. Maybe not right now. We need more stories or songs. I already gave you my limerick. Jane, can we just examine you in the front? Because you've got a lot of stories on your chest. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone is welcome to stare at my front for. I see the flower room. Yeah, there's like this is the dragon. That's the dragon. What's the dragon? It's a nice little girl. Yeah. You're out of touch, Jane. You're out of touch, Jane. Is my room on there? I don't know. Where's your room? Where's the room? Where's the, room? Where's the back side. The, is the, rush. the other side. Well, it doesn't exist. Back corner. Back corner. The back corner. The room doesn't exist anymore. I don't know. I don't know if it's on there. You can't open it. I thought it was in France for year 50. Yeah, we got it. It's a flower room. That's the flower room. I originated the flower room. I just have to say. It's a little tiny, stupid artwork. Still on the door frame? That was mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were supposed to get a bunch of like Stonehenge like things to put in the front. That was our plan when we were oh, living nice. there. And it never really happened. I think maybe it sat in the backyard for a bit. But that was why there was Because that was yeah. presumably gonna forever be there uh, it, afterwards for the when I did the shirt. A good testament to uh, like what else things. is there? There's the the um, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of the room. Uh, the, the, with the ghost. The skylight coffin? The coffin, yeah, the coffin. Oh, yeah, now it's called the skylight. Oh, it's called the skylight. It's called the skylight in there, now it's called the skylight. The skylight coffin. Um, the red thing coming out of the coat. The yeah, this, this out here coming out of the, um, the, the coat is, part. yeah, because Holly lived right? in Layla lived there and had, like, millions and millions of, like, neatly organized, like, robot parts. Uh, oh. And, oh. Servo motors and everything, you know, so. Layla has some? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so that, that was basically what I would expect to come out the window. Who did there. the drawing? And, it's and a great drawing. That's what he's yeah, narrating. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's a great drawing. drawing. Thank you. Yes. I think that's pretty much everything. If yeah, Holly and Layla were in the coach, and that would have been like '98 that you did the drawing, I think. I guess so. I, I should have worn my T-shirt that yeah. looks like the sign from the Turnpike that says Mass Pike. <laughs> you still have that? Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, pretty short. Yeah, I forgot all about it. Do so you have the original one? Yeah, I found. I have the really new folder. Yeah. I've, also, I've, I've also got the one that says yeah. Thursday yeah. four stars. Yeah, it, like much higher resolution probably than whatever is existing in the. Yeah. Like this is the first book. Like what all oh. things are. Yeah. So we can remember it later. Yeah. That is really a, a cool shirt. Yeah. It's good. We decided we needed more tanks. Gross. Gross, 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 gross. Right, I'm going to go back to grilling the things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, grilling is good. enough to be next? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm still writing. Okay, we're going to have a musical number soon. So, um, Steve, I've never known you to be shy. Oh, we've got a volunteer. I'm going to go, but there's a pretty big gap between me and Jade, I think we need I think we need somebody from the from the nineties or or oh, oh, yeah. to Okay, and I'm gonna go with yeah. uh, uh, some uh, other Mark Rios was here from two thousand to two thousand five. So uh, so once upon a time there was a work week and I was bashing through some drywall, like you know, as you do with work week. And I found the time capsule in there, which was like 19, you know, I think like 1970-ish Playboy and a newspaper <laughs> and like this, you know, this this letter to the future. That was said an actual true story of Murphy. Really? Yeah, no, no shit. I'm really this is for real. Um, so what happened was that apparently Murphy was told he needs to get out of the house. And he said he had a couple of days. So he's sad because he lived there for a long time. So it was on a long walk. And he goes all the way to Haymarket 
and he finds that there's this, uh, you know, like you can buy a lot of weird things at Haymarket, usually stuff and food that's about to go off. Lots but, of meat. But, Lots of meat. <laughs> yeah, but this time was a stand you've never seen before, which is a stand that sold uh, exotica from around the world, including a genie holding a monkey's paw. Uh, so he got this for like five bucks, uh, we took it back home, and he says, okay, well, I've read some dumb stories about this. I think I'm going to be the first guy who actually gets this right and actually has my three wishes, and then, like, everything works out all right. <laughs> so he said, well, clearly one of the wishes is going to be that I want to stay in this room forever. Uh, so I've got some two other ones that I could do. Um, and so the first wish is that he wished he knew would, like, you know, uh, what come up the best thing possible, but the monkey paw comes to like, you know, goes like that. And then the second was he wants to figure out the meaning of life, and what happens is that he follows this compulsion to look in the mirror, and then suddenly, in bright, shining lights, beer is food was written on the mirror. Of the <laughs> and then he said, okay, now let's do this. I've got one third wish left. I never want to leave this room ever again. So then the monkey paw goes down, and then he turns into a bathtub. <laughs> Well, you know, I think it was Smokey Paul was pretty smart because it figured no piking would actually bother to move the thing out. And, you know, <laughs> also, you could sit in it if you put pillows in it. Yeah. So it uh, works out. I vaguely remember a time capsule. Vaguely. And I, I, I thought when the renovations were done, there was a know. time capsule that was uncovered in the kitchen. I believe that was Earl's lasagna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. It was Earl's yeah. lasagna. Yeah. The mo one of the, probably the most, the biggest attractions when I was here trying to get people to move into the house, especially women to move in the house, number one was the staircase that went nowhere. Number two was the, the bookcase that was actually a door. Yes. Yep. And number three, and most importantly, was Earl's lasagna, <laughs> which was great. Earl's, Dan Nolette and Teresa Costanza, who met here and got married, had Earl cater their wedding with his lasagna. Wow. It was that good. So who else is next? Who's got a good story? How about some older? I don't have a good story, but I do have the Murph story. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> They're all good stories, George. George Madrid, class of approximately 91, <laughs> whatever the hell that means. Grounded down in I don't know, I was not here nine years, no degrees, so okay. you do the math. Because I couldn't do it. <laughs> Which is why you never got the degree. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, there was, there was this guy from oh, Pica who went into a talent agent. And he said, no. <laughs> Go ahead. My story. <laughs> His story, yeah. This guy from Pika. He goes into a talent agent and he says, Man, have I got an act oh, for you. It's a great act. <laughs> it's a great act. You've never seen anything like this before in your life. And the talent agent sits back in his chair and he says, You know, I've seen just about everything. What makes your act special? He says, Well, first, you take about 30 guys and you move them into a house. But there's this one guy who won't leave. He's there from before, his name is Murphy. And the tele agent sits back, he's like, okay, okay, you've got two minutes. He says, okay, this guy named Murphy, he won't move out, he's there from before and he refuses to leave. He's like, this is my room, I can stay here as long as I want. And he barricades himself in. And these 30 guys move in, and they go about their lives. Except there's this guy in what is the perfect living room. They're all like, yeah, that would be a great living room if this guy weren't living in there. So there's, they got, the Natalia is getting a little impatient, so I'm getting a little bored. He speed this up, he says, okay, there are three things you have to remember about Mr. Murphy. First, he wouldn't leave. Second, he was not a friend to these guys. And third, he wouldn't leave. <laughs> okay, okay, I got those three things. Keep it moving. He says, okay, well, there are three things you gotta know about how this all worked out. There was some sort of, it's all vague at this point. I don't really know exactly what happened. There's a staged fight or 
excavations or someone looked in the window. But anyway, they go in there, Mr. Murphy's gone. Apparently he had moved all of his stuff out the window. That's the first thing you have to remember. He moved all of his stuff out the window except for three things. A typewriter, a Cyrillic typewriter. They have Q in Cyrillic? No, there was no Q on that typewriter. So that fact is true because it was a Cyrillic typewriter. Amazing. Okay, I can go die now. He left a box of Cheerios with one Fruit Loop in it, <laughs> and he left a note on the mirror that said, beer is food. Those are the three things that Mr. Murphy left behind. And then those guys stayed there, and they lived there, and then girls lived there, and they lived there, and then here I am today telling you this story. And the talent agent leans back and says, yeah, I don't buy it. <laughs> and that's my story. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell the aristocrat. I did. <laughs> as, as did I. Did anybody actually watch the video of the aristocrat? I own the video. I've seen it many times. Yes. <laughs> Bob Saget was a complete surprise in that movie. Was, was like, he, oh, oh, oh. Was oh, he not amazing? Yeah, he Bob Saget amazing. is mind-boggling. Oh, oh, I is, never knew of Bob Saget. That was not the same Bob Saget not from Three's guy. Company. No. This oh, is a, a documentary <laughs> that is worth watching. Watching, but make sure there are no kids around. <laughs> it's really it is the telling <laughs> about 50 comedians, some of them brilliant, telling a single obscene, horrible, bad joke. And some of them just it's wonderful. It is definitely worth it. I think Bob Sykes is probably the best of the bunch. Yeah, he really is. I forget the guy's name. Dogs like this. I like Gilbert. I thought Gilbert, Gilbert Godfrey. Yeah, well, Gilbert Godfrey, Gilbert Godfrey is Godfrey always is like that, though. Yeah. Whereas people have seeing, a completely different image uh, of Bob Saget. It starts slow, but yeah, when people like get into this, this right. people know him from Full House, but like his his act is notoriously foul. Right? I know. Yeah. Gilbert Godfrey. But he won't was, talk about the Olsen twins. That's the one thing that's off limits. Gilbert Godfrey was on TV just about two weeks ago. Who's next? We need more volunteers. More people to tell us the truth about Mr. Murphy and our living room. So we made it up to 95. I will tell you the truth. Right, okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Hey, this is the, this is the. I'm, I'm not a storyteller. I'm just a truth teller. And this <laughs> this is the truth as it was told to me by Chris Hampkins, who was a few years before me. And this was not some embellished story. It's just how it happened. Like you've you've heard. I mean, between the previous embellished stories, you can kind of get little little threads. There's certain threads because. Yes, Pika bought the house, and yes, Pika was 30 guys, and yes, it had been, it hadn't been a boarding house. It had been a bunch of apartments. I think, mean, you know, many of these, you know, like the, the, the 269 side was an apartment. It had its own kitchen and a couple rooms, and it had been six apartments, but there was one studio apartment, which was the room we now, it's a living room, it's we call it the Murph, and that's the point of the story, because that was a little studio apartment, and it didn't even have its own bathroom, but in those days, there was not a fire door. You, you guys all know that it's easy to get from the first floor 69 side to the first floor 69 side. As if it's always house. been easy. And, and let me tell you kids, we had it rough. Not only did we have to go uphill in the snow both ways, we had to either go up to the second floor to get to the 71 side, or we had to loop around the back deck here and go through Arnie's room to get to the 71 side yeah. because there was no... cold and IEP. There was no fire door Close the goddamn because door. under the stairs where that fire door is now next to the Murph phone desk, is it, do you even call the phone desk anymore? There's no phone on it. You call 6983 and nobody answers. There's a phone. There is a phone there. Last night to see if but it's not the old that. rotary phone that we had, had <laughs> wired. Underneath <laughs> that stairwell used to be this little tiny bathroom. And that was Murphy's bathroom. Murphy had to come out through the doors and, and, and use the loo under the stairs because he had this little this little old studio apartment. With a pay phone in it. You no, know, that's your mixing stories, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that's not allowed. <laughs> You remember? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm making things up. I could tell the payphone story because John Sieber told me that story, but we'd be here all night. So yes. let's get back to Murph because, yeah, Pika moved in and Murphy didn't want to leave. You all heard that. His name was Edwin J. Murph, by the way. I don't, I don't know what all this, this Cyrus or well, Mongolia is. His name was Edwin J. Murphy. That's the truth. Someone told me this, so I know it's the truth. Edwin J. Murphy. It was on the web. 
was was the was the lodger in the studio, and, and yes, as you heard, he didn't want to leave because he was, you know, he, this was 1970. He was probably paying 50 bucks a month in rent or some nonsense. He didn't want to leave, and Pike, as someone accurately observed, was non-confrontational, and Pike had work to do. And then there may not have been 30 people; there may have been 29 people, and they had to demolish the kitchen that used to be the kitchen of the 269 apartment. They had to demolish the kitchen that used to be the kitchen of the 171 apartment. And they were they had a lot of work to do, and every day, not every day, but you know, they pass Murphy in the hall and say, Hey, you know, I we hate to evict you, but we did buy the place and you're out of here that he didn't want to go. And Pike didn't want to evict him. Pike didn't want to evict him and but but eventually after Pika had converted most of the rest of the house to its uses, Pika really kind of wanted well it was Pike Cap Alpha in those days, of course. <laughs> But, but by this time, yes, he had boarded himself up. He had become quite reclusive. He was rarely seen. He might have said some profanities when provoked. Uh, but, but he boarded himself up with the toilet not from on the outside. No, he snuck out in the middle. When he, when he, 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 maybe he listened to the door or something. And when no one was around, or at, at 3 a.m., he would tiptoe out and, and use the loo and, and, and go back to his room. But um, or he set his ass for protection. But it, 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 it eventually... Even though Pika didn't want to be confrontational, it really was time to 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 do something. And, and talking did not work. The, the, I'm, I'm telling the truth, by the way. The one the one embellishment that Chris Hampkins made when he told me this story is that this just sounds silly. Some Pike and staged a fight outside his door as if it was going to frighten him into leaving. And um, I thought it was an embellishment. Someone told me the truth. I honestly don't know. Truth the, the truth gets slippery after a while. But but a fight was evidently staged, and and maybe the fight broke the door down or something. But eventually, Pika did have to to break into the room to to because they hadn't even heard from him in a while. You know, they, they they hadn't heard him tiptoeing out into because Pike. You know, these are my T students. They're up at 3 a.m. So people knew that Mr. Murphy was tiptoeing out to use the loo in the middle of the night. But eventually, they hadn't heard from him in quite some time, and he was elderly. And if he was you know, Dang. oystering himself in there. So, so Pike eventually broke down the door to make sure that he was um, okay. He, he, he was gone. He was gone. He had, he had, he had some, at some point, he had just left. <laughs> and uh, Pike didn't want to, you know, it was bad enough to evict him. They didn't want to rob him. So Pike very carefully packed all of his belongings that he left behind into some big black plastic garbage bags, but but but, but treasured and, and carefully held for, for years the uh, the big black plastic garbage bags full of Edwin J. Murphy's belongings were, were carefully kept under the workbench downstairs just in case yeah. Murphy ever came to claim them. But he never came to claim them. There was and and, and but, but 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 the room but. was named in his honor. The the, Murph, the, the, the Edwin J. Murphy Memorial Lounge was 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 named in his honor. And, and that's the story as I was told that somehow nobody has mentioned the best embellishments. So for entertainment purposes only, I do I do mention the awesome embellishments. The the belongings were held to include the aforementioned typewriter that was missing the letter Q, but after quite some time, the young'uns would tell me the version of the story that no, no, the belongings you left behind were a typewriter without the letter Q and a box of Alphabet's cereal containing only Q's, <laughs> uh, which, which, certainly, which certainly rates for, for, uh, for creativity, if not any kind of verisimilitude. But that's, that's the story as I was told. With but Steve, then how do you explain the magical appearance of beer is food on the mirror? Well, that's just no. That was, that was, that, well, that was Pikins, wasn't it? And that, that, that was somewhere in the Flora's friend can't fall off floor era. Third floor. That was that was 1974. And, oh, and what about it feels about like that. electricity? Who remembers that line? Because <laughs> that was those lines. Was my roommate. That was Neil Painter, wasn't it? He, he dropped an entire pike pan of lasagna on his foot and broke his ankle. No, no, I no think it was he, Earl Cohen that dropped it on Neil. Oh Peter. my! Oh, no, Earl Cohen. It was Earl that dropped it on Neil. Oh, Earl dropped the meat cleaver on his toe. Oh, that's right. Different story. I thought beer is food gave for Don and Kevin. I thought beer and food beer is food gave for Don and Kevin. I don't remember. Jim Hader always had a claim to it too. I don't remember. True. That's interesting. God, these are all names. Are they even on the list? I don't know. I haven't looked at the list in seven years. Right? Arnie, Jim Hader had a blue card. 
Arnie, you have to help me. After <laughs> you Earl dropped the meat cleaver on his toe, there was he had some a, award he had a little he gave sports out. Car. Last time was the Earl T. Cohen um, Memorial Self Mutilation yeah, Award? That's yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that lasted for a while. That, oh, did it? That, I, I mean, it was given to Mary David my yeah, freshman year when she few years, a few years broke back. the jaw and had it wired shut, and nobody even noticed for three months because she never talked oh, much. Yeah. Even <laughs> that's <laughs> a slight exaggeration. <laughs> But then there was, I mean, what about, I mean, but, but Earl was absolutely associated with that meat cleaver, and, and I, I wasn't here, but somebody who's older than me can tell the story about the birthday cake that had the inflated piece of surgical rubble tubing baked into it and the meat cleaver next to it, so of course he's going to cut the cake with the meat cleaver and the inflated piece of surgical rubber tubing is going to explode and make a mess, except somebody underestimated the toughness of surgical rubber tubing. So Earl was very glad to have the meat cleaver. Oh boy, this will be fun. He, he continued, he, smart guy. He understood the role he was expected to play. He took a mighty whack at the cake and the meat cleaver bounces back out of the cake. Most people, if the meat cleaver bounces back, I mean, this is like, this is like, what's the, what's the, the almighty particle that bounces back off the bowling ball? It cost me a board to invent the atom. But anyway, the, the meat cleaver bounces back out of the cake. Most people would have said, something's fishy here. <laughs> Earl took an whack, and this time, the surgical rubber tube exploded and spread the cake all over the dining room. Uh, Why can't we get these people to come back for these? That things. was a good one too, but somebody else can tell that one. Uh, who was the electric birthday cake? What was the electric birthday? Who wants to tell the electric birthday cake? Birthday cake. But I wasn't here. Somebody who was here should tell that. I don't remember who designed it. Right? I mean, I can tell it the way it should have happened, but then my reaction was Go for it. How could it have happened? Okay. Well, I remember we had. I'm trying to remember. Is it Earl or Mark Schaefer? We have to tell him to hold the pan while you come to the table. No, that was him. That was him. Oh, I, I, I built the cake, so I don't want to tell the story. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought we were doing it on you. No, it was, it was Dick Mahal. Dick Mahal. Yeah, yeah. Dick. Dick. So, Dick. so. Dick. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you tell it, but I don't. So, so my roommate comes running into my room one afternoon and says, it's Dick Mahal's birthday, we have to do something special. Because we'd all heard the Earl Cohen meat cleaver story. We had to do something special. And somehow, somehow the, the, the collective consciousness came up with the idea of an electric cake. And, and the basic outlines of the idea is that it was a big pica of aluminum pan, and we were going to bake a nice moist cake, and there was going to be the cake was going to be electrified yes. somehow. <laughs> and when he cut into the cake, he was going to get a shock. <laughs> and it was really important to find a knife. You know, if you look at a knife carefully, some knives have wooden handles, and some knives have wooden handles with metal rivets yes. going through the wood. And so we made sure that the knife had the metal rivets coming through. So even though he saw, somebody thought of that, somebody else thought of well, what if he's not holding? the metal pan to complete the circuit. So somebody put grease on the bottom of the metal pan so the pan's sliding on the day so we have to hold it. So we have to hold, hold the pan. Yeah, but then it's not grounded. And I made this little circuit that had a nine volt battery run backwards through a transformer to generate who knows how many volts and a little 555 timer to make a square wave with nice inductive spikes that you really feel. And we hollowed out a bottom of the cake and we put aluminum foil, we, no, we put plastic wrap in the bottom of the pan to insulate the cake from the pan. And there was, there was, and it, it was wonderful, and it was, but then, but then, but then, oh no, what but happened, then. Steve? What happened? Sarah Slaughter was afraid that if we carried the cake out to Dick, turned on, we might hurt ourselves. <laughs> the, person like carrying, the person carrying the cake might have accidentally gotten a shock. Before Dick could get a shock, so I don't quite know. But so, so, so. In order to be safe, it became necessary to put the cake in the middle of the table and turn it on, and then call Dick down. And somebody. Well, it, it took like five minutes to find the guy, and this whole circuit was run off one little nine volt battery. Oh, no. And everybody, the, the longer it took to find Dick Mahal, the the more expectant people got. So Dick wanders in the room, and there's 29 <laughs> extremely expectant like <laughs> oh. and, and he says, something's going on. No, no, it's your birthday. Just cut the cake. Just cut the cake. <laughs> 
something. He absolutely refused <laughs> to cut the cake. So I said, Dick, I'll prove to you, I'll prove to you that nothing's wrong. And I took the knife and I held the pan and I touched and I felt <laughs> because the poor little battery, and, and it was it was completely dead. It was completely dead. But he still he still wouldn't even cut the game. But it was it was a valiant effort. There was an embellishment. There was an embellishment that is told that the battery somehow kept its own through five minutes of finding Dick Mahal, and that it was still at full strength. And that when I cut it, the entire battery got drained through me, and that is why Dick didn't get shocked. But in fact, it was you know it was it was dead. But it was I still have I still have the circuit somewhere on my jungle. Oh my so God. God. <laughs> it had some truth because when Steve was rewiring the basement, I mean, see the ceiling, and he needed to tell if this is a live circuit. How do you check live circuits if you're Steve Summit? Uh, I use it. No, you use it on touch Back then, Tesla. he was just touching wires. No, that's an embellishment. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can do it. The, the right way to use a neon test lamp is you put one end of the neon test lamp on something grounded and one end of the neon test lamp on what might be live, and the neon light lights up orange, and that tells you. But if you can't find something that's grounded, which in a house like this, you can't find anything that's grounded. So you hold one end of the neon test lamp and you touch the other end of the neon test lamp and it glows really faintly because your body has enough capacity. You don't feel anything, you don't feel anything. It's not, it's not some macho thing, it's just, a, it's just a handy little trick. But that's how you can take the full charge to you and then when there was still some left and when Dick did it, he got a surprising charge. No, no, if, if that really should have been. If, if you're really stupid, if you're really stupid, then if you've seen the birds sitting on the, on the power lines and observe that, oh, since the circuit is not completed, they're not grounded, you don't get a shock. If you're really stupid, you can sit on a metal bench down in the TV room when the TV room is being rewired and rebuilt into the TV room, and you can take a live wire 110 volts <coughs> the amps behind it and put it in your mouth <laughs> just to demonstrate to the assembly blocks that that thing in 802 really is real. But that's really stupid. I don't, I don't really know. That, but, uh, how, about, how about subway rails? Oh, that's a very different story. It's not connected to the house. You lived no, that was in, that was between Harvard and Central. That's not a Pika story. That's not that's not that's a pizza story. That's not that's not a story. That belongs in so, next year's story, so. Well, what, what is a devil's cocktail? Oh, I think where are all the pyro lungs? They're supposed to be pyro lungs blowing up. Right? Arnie, it's still in there. Is it still in there? No, I don't want to demonstrate. We're going to right. demonstrate here. There's somebody else is in there now. We all get busted something off the road. <laughs> but we should see. I bet they pitched it. But we should see. It there was done in the backyard. It was done there. The, the, the devil's cock on the railroad. Yeah. What is the devil's cocktail? 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 Is a kitchen safety demonstration. You may have heard. You may have heard that it's some high, you know, MIT students. <laughs> So it's a devil's cocktail. A devil's cocktail. I'm not, I, I can't show it to the camera because that would involve tipping and pouring. No, a devil's cocktail is, have you heard that if there is a grease fire in your kitchen, you should not put water on it to put it out because it doesn't work? Well, the, the, the devil's cocktail is a demonstration, a, a very visceral, you, you know, learning experience. You take, you take a boil, you take a pot of oil, and it can't have any water in it. This Most is a public oil has service message. <laughs> This is a public service message. That's this is right. a public service message. Right. Right. Don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> train <laughs> train professionals only. Don't you, try you, this in other people's homes. You put the pot, you put the pot on the, the stove, you put the on the stove, and you boil it for about an hour. So you gotta boil all the water off. If it's, ran, if it's the rancid grease from the from the bucket under the under the sink, it stinks up the whole 69 side, but that's okay because this is the name of science. Side two. science. <laughs> well, they've got a sensitive nose. Um, the, you, 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 you take the boiling chimney. grease, you take Earl's the boiling chimney. grease into a safe place like the backyard and <laughs> the tree's nice and green so it won't burn. Yes. And you you but. take the you take the grease and you put it on something sturdy like three bricks and you put some torches underneath and you've got some propane torches. You've got acetylene torches, that's better because they burn hotter. Because you need to get the grease up to the point where it'll burn. Um, Grease, grease is. Don't you know, I don't know how people light fires in the kitchen with grease because grease is not that dangerous. You got to get really hot before it burns. 
because yeah. but but if you if you get it hot yeah, enough, you can take a lighter <laughs> and you can light it. And it, it, it this is this is not the scary part. This is not the scary part <laughs> because you get this lazy little blue flame. Looks like a little sterno can yeah, underneath the fondue. Yeah. Yeah. Nice little flame. And now you demonstrate why you don't put grease in the fire. And this is where it gets a little bit water, sketchy water, because water, water, water. you need, what did I say, grease? Yeah, you don't, you don't want to put a grease fire with water because you take a quarter cup measuring cup and you tape it with duct tape onto, no, that's not long enough. It does. <laughs> you can leave this at least, at, least, at least a six foot stick, preferably eight, a ten foot eight. stick. I've done it with eight. eight. And you stand way back, Nine. and you pour just videos. a little bit of water into that boiling plate. No, 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 no. you got to dump it. And what dump happens? it. The so whole point is to do it. And not too much. I mean, the ratio is critical. <laughs> yeah. We never did figure out the right ratio. But it's only a kid. It's, 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 it's not science. It's just a kids and shits and safety demonstration. <laughs> uh, and if, if, you're trying to get, if you're trying to get the ratio right, that suggests you're going for spectacle or some shit. No, we're just, we're just going for education here. <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason you don't want to put a grease fire out with water is that if there's no fire involved, if you, just, if you just put some water and some oil, A, oil and water don't mix, but what floats on the top and what goes to the bottom? Yep. Oil is less dense than water. So you, you, pour, you pour a little bit of water into that hot, burning, oily grease. And the water says, the water says, it's good to anthropomorphize in these, in these. <laughs> the water says, oh, look, it's oil. Oh, look, it's oil. I'm heavier than oil. I should sink to the bottom. OK, all this little water molecules, we're going to sink to the bottom. Holy shit. It's really hot in here. Really hot in here. What was that number again? 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees centigrade. I, guys, it's hotter than that. We're supposed to boil. Yeah. Let's all be steam together. <laughs> so the way, but so the water flashes to steam. The water flashes to steam. Steam is lighter than oil. Steam is lighter than oil. So the steam comes erupting out of the can. And wait, oh by the way, the water was busy emulsifying down through the oil, and so now we're erupting out. The only real, the only reason that 700 degree oil was burning with a nice lazy blue flame is because there was a bunch of oil. And there was, what's this diameter, please? About about six inches. Yeah. Radius is about three inches. Th uh, pi r squared, nine times three. 18 square inches is not a whole lot of surface area. But when the, when the steam emulsifies the water, you've got, I'm not going to do the math, you've got much, much, much more surface area. So all the oil is burning at once. And you really have to see this to believe it. Oh, no. That, that sounds like spectacle. No, this is, this is a cold, sober scientific demonstration. But you do get this insane, amazing fireball that you really, really would not want in your kitchen. You really, really, and, you, and, the, and the reason for the ten-foot pole is partly so you don't get burned by this. And probably because not all the oil burns, and it kind of rains, rains oil down, and that's kind of disgusting. But that's that is the that's the question. Where did I borrow this from? Who makes the oil back? From the stove. Don't dump water. 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 Don't for pikins to do, no. but it was not the Wait most dangerous thing oh. that Pika, I think, has ever attempted. Um, and now I know that a number of our alumni have um, uh, gone to work for various agencies that don't exist, or, or if you did know that they existed, you wouldn't exist for very long, or things like that. So I don't know what Pika alums have done, but pikins at Pika have actually been involved in nuclear research. <laughs> uh, because there was a day, and I'm trying to remember the exact date, I think it was roughly the 29th of November 1989, but I may be off by a couple of weeks. Um, and it was a Thursday night, and I came over to the house, I was an alum by a year at that point, and I came over to the house for dinner, and there was nobody in the kitchen, and there was nobody in the dining room, and there was everybody in the TV room, and there were these two guys on television talking about how they had achieved fusion in a glass jar. <laughs> and this was like, yeah, right, okay, um, I'm a physics major, and what the heck are they talking about? And these are two electrochemists whose names you probably all know, and they had done some electrolysis involving palladium. And palladium 
is a metal that has the strange property of absorbing hydrogen atoms into its lattice structure. And you can actually take a cube of palladium and put it in a hydrogen environment and it will bulge out. You can actually see the bulging of the thing. It's actually kind of remarkable. And was sitting there dutifully writing down all the facts that she could get from this from this uh, news story in her notebook that she carried with her everywhere she went and there were like three facts written in the notebook and that was it and they'd been there for hours and after another hour of watching we kind of looked and said we're not getting any more facts out of these guys and they hadn't published and they hadn't this and they hadn't quite that but it was very very exciting so you know what we have to do <laughs> so Mari, Mari worked in chem lab and had access to some heavy water, which was what they claimed they had used. And Mike Saunier worked in the heavy ion lab and therefore had access to all different types of metals, including palladium. And he was also a junior lab teaching assistant. Um, and so, but it was weird. He was a senior undergraduate assistant, not a graduate assistant. And so a whole bunch of us, including, I think, Dave? No, no. no. Jennifer, Jennifer for sure. Dennis Federico. Yeah. Maria, Seth. Dean Petrick. Yes. At least, at least that group of individuals. Um, all traipsed over to campus and collected the heavy water and collected the little palladium foils from Blank's lab and got into the junior lab and decided, okay, what do we need to do? We need to do this carefully and safely. So we rated all the experiments that have been set up in the room um, and, and collected all the lead bricks that were in the junior <laughs> lab and made this little lead brick house, kind of like kids now do in Minecraft. I mean, <laughs> um, and, we, and we got a beaker and we, we, we you know, put the little thing with the heavy water in it and the two, the, there was a, the, the palladium foil and then another electrode and we got a power supply and we need to something to measure it with. All they have in junior lab is Geiger counters. <laughs> Geiger counters do not count the kind of radiation that's produced in fusion of hydrogen. But that's okay, we needed a measuring tool and so we had used the measuring tool uh, and, and we put it there and, and we did some, uh, <coughs> You know, we, we did some some electrolysis and we looked at it for a while and then we kind of got bored and we were about to go home and Mike said wait 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 we have to record this and he looked around and he grabbed an oscilloscope camera which was a Polaroid camera on the back of this little thing that you would like jam up on the oscilloscope so it had a fixed focus and a fixed shutter speed and a fixed uh, uh, exposure time, uh, 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 aperture, and he just kind of uh, sort of held it and snapped the picture, and it was blurry and it was terrible, and we all went home. And if you Google on Nova, you can find it. Uh -oh. Little known to the rest of us, <laughs> Michael took it upon himself to tack the picture to the supervising teaching assistant's door. <laughs> <laughs> This might have been the only error that we committed that night. <laughs> <laughs> the following day, some telephone calls were received from the um, radiation safety office. <laughs> what did you do? Where did you do it? Where is all the stuff? And what were you wearing? And bring it all right now. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. If you want to remain <coughs> students. <laughs> okay, okay. So we, we explained what we did, and we told them we were quite confident that there wasn't any radiation, because after all, we used the Geiger counter. <laughs> which was very boring all night. Um, and uh, no, we didn't have a neutron counter. Yes, we did know that neutrons would have been released in this reaction. No, yes, no, yes, sir, no, sir. Okay. Uh, all this stuff was collected, and it was discovered that there was no radiation anywhere. There were some very disappointed radiations. <laughs> but that wasn't it. So that was Friday. Saturday morning, the director of the Plasma Fusion Center started rounding us up and said, where is your palladium? Uh, well, the radiation safety office has it. Because we can't get any! <laughs> <laughs> 
Because, <laughs> of course, the price of palladium on Friday morning had skyrocketed. <laughs> uh, leading many to speculate that uh, the subsequent riches of certain individuals who had previously lived in Utah um, and done work at Brigham Young University might have had something to do with the announcement they made the previous night. Um, but it was only speculation. Uh, there were no convictions. Uh, uh, so, so the... Well, the, there's no law against speculating relations, is there? No, but there is law against, um, uh, against manipulating the markets. Um, and, and so, again, we hauled down this time to the Plasma Fusion Center, and we were we were informed that we had to show up wearing hiking boots because sneakers and open-toed shoes were not allowed in the Plasma Fusion Center because they carry around lead bricks, which if you drop them, they could hurt your feet. And I'm sure that if you dropped a lead foot, a lead brick on your foot while wearing a hiking boot, it would still hurt. Um, but maybe maybe they could then claim that they had done their due diligence or something. So we were now co-investigators <laughs> on what I think is probably the largest amount of power ever put into what was probably at that point a few milliliters left of heavy water, which was covered with a trash can that had a hole on the side of it and a camera and a light going through the hole and all the rest of us behind a, um, a, a, a masking taped off area way over there, much farther away than all the real investigators. Um, and so quickly they evaporated the sample and we all went home. <laughs> But that was not the end of it. <laughs> because about six weeks later, we got a phone call from the British Broadcasting Corporation. <laughs> which was doing a program, appropriately named Confusion in a Jar. Confusion <laughs> in a Jar. Would we please show up? Oh, well, where should, where should we go? Should we go to the, the, the junior lab where we actually... No, 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 you can't go there. Why not? Well, the, the MIT won't let us film there. Where will MIT let you film? Um, at your house. <laughs> so, sorry? And, and building four, which was nice and far away from anything involving the physics department. So, um, we were portrayed as the Pikas, a physics society. <laughs> <laughs> we went to ESG, which we all had access to because we were mostly friends from there, um, from which we pilfered an oscilloscope and a power supply, and it was one of these sort of longer, thinner power supplies, which was convenient for carrying under the arm. And for a while they filmed us running up and down the stairs of building four, <laughs> filming us from the outside, through the windows, at night, carrying these oscilloscopes going up and down. And, up. and I'm like, what am I doing, running green buildings? I am not, I'm green. Why would they outside? Because they could get a really good shot. It's hard to take pictures of people going up the stairs when you're on the stairs. It's better to do it. And then, you know, so then we went downstairs, on the 69 side, on the pool table, and set up as close as we could get, which was not very, to the original experimental setup. And of course, at that point, we were wearing tape goggles, <laughs> <laughs> which we were not wearing <laughs> in reality. Um, and, and the BBC filmed us doing electrolysis with not heavy water and two pieces of aluminum foil. <laughs> but who could tell? Um, on the pool table on the 69 side of the basement. And in the show, they interviewed all these people from all these serious universities all over the country, unlike this one, and all over the world, trying to do experiments with heavy water and palladium and swapping a sample and the real and the control and the real and doing it for months and months and months and getting the same result that we did, which is the same. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. And then they show a picture of us running up the stairs. <laughs> and then they do another university and they had these rods going into the reactor and rods coming out of the reactor and things going into the reactor and things coming out of the reactor and getting the same result that we got, which was... <laughs> and then they show us down at the pool table with the electrolysis not happening. And they paid us $50 as a group, which made, I later figured out, oh, now we're actors. You got your sack not on. Not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does that mean you have a Bernard Bacon number now? You've published a paper. 
an academic paper and have you been on the, uh, credited on TV? Right? I, have, I have published an academic paper and I have been credited on TV, but not for the same thing. No, but actually I have been, but not for this. <laughs> but that, I think, was the end of it. And we do have, the episode was, was sold to PBS and they actually made a note episode out of it and we do have VHS tape. <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to on YouTube. I was okay, well then. And you were being interviewed in a Spanish shirt. Yes, I was wearing a Spanish shirt. All these formal professors with their. What do you search up? Just to make sure that nobody can get into this for our research. Everybody knows what Spanish stands for, right? Anybody not know what Spanish stands for? Stupid people at MIT. Yes. What was it? There was Manson Manis and and one of them is like with the hammer is thumb. Yeah. Yeah. I love the title. Confusion. Confusion. Yeah, yeah, right. I like that. That was the most That's a really bad title. It was the least or most dangerous thing if I could say that. Except for stealing side. <laughs> okay, we have the musical version. We're going to come back. Yeah, this is Yay! I know in a story slam you're not supposed to read, but I just wrote this song 10 minutes ago. Is there a chorus uh, that people could sing along with? Uh, maybe Introduce maybe yourselves. Sort of. uh, I'm about to. So uh, we are, of course, the Dipstick Murphys. Dipstick Murphys. <laughs> 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 uh, you do a little higher. That's good. Perfect. That's good. All right. Hopefully I can. Maybe we should give the heads up. I can't read this. Yeah, so, yeah. so what's this? What's the chorus? I don't know what it is. The chorus. What's this the chorus? is completely unrehearsed. So let's go. On with this. Oh, I don't mind the chorus. So you're, I'm good. Don't worry about it. You'll get okay. follow with me. I'm not going to read it. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah, take a picture of it and blow it up on the screen here. Alright, I think I'm getting it. It is a banjo. banjo and a ukulele. What do you want? Alright. Alright, ready? Oh, founders of Plank up down the perfect dwelling on 69 Chestnut Street. There were plenty of rooms for brilliant men and women. This home is really sweet. But could we get him to leave? No. Our living room was his turf. He would live forever in the house of Pika. He's the man who lived in the murph. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> it was awesome. Good for you. <laughs> that was fun. Good job. There was an undergraduate. I got it. I got it. Uh, anything, anything anybody wants to do. So, as we all know, you know, the, the third stairs, you know, living area has always been called the Murphlet because it's a small Murph, right? I mean, what's a Murph? Well, that's another story. But anyway, so my freshman year, there was several of us living off the Murflet. There was Karen, and there was the Gonzos, Mark and uh, Dan, and then there was Andrew and uh, Dan. Dan Leary. Yeah, that's right. Because Aaron, I was thinking it was Aaron's son. And then there was me. And so clearly this was no longer the Murflet, it was the Freshlet. And so there we were in the Freshlet, and you know, there'd be a certain amount of freshmen studying together. And you know, the interesting thing was that uh, we came up with some rules. And you know, for instance, there's an important calculus rule which says it's called Glop It All's rule. And you know, if it doesn't integrate the first time, you glop it all in the trash can. <laughs> so that was an important rule that was discovered. And then the other thing is somehow it became a thing. Maybe you can talk more about it than I can, but <laughs> but the uh, but the thing was that somehow the, the staircase was a thing. In fact, it was a deity. And so whenever there was a problem, if you made a sacrifice to the staircase god by throwing something down the staircase, it helped whatever was wrong. <laughs> and that's basically the end of the story. <laughs> guys you saw, you know, they all moved into the house, you know the founders. And they're Fonders. actually they're Fonders. actually what founder did. They're actually pretty pretty tame guys right now. What they won't tell you is that there actually was no murder. Okay. Oh. <laughs> this, this That's the real truth. Yeah. Okay, these guys moved into the house and they were a little wild and there was some stuff like possibly some illicit substances that some neighbors saw in the window. And you know, I think I think they got a shot of somebody complaining about somebody booting neighbors out the window. And even I remember some story about a, a, a Roman candle fight, which supposedly took out place out here, but I think they actually tried early on in that room there. And with all this stuff going on, you know, that's why they had the chemical warfare outfits for the Roman candle yeah. fire. Well, with all, with all this stuff going on, neighbors got a bit upset. And they started calling the, the police, and, and at one point, the police and the fire marshals came. And these guys didn't really want to get kicked out. So they actually, they, they had been, seen, been watching uh, One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest, and they remembered Randall Patrick Murphy, and they said, oh, Murphy! Murphy was here. You know, when we moved in, there was this guy who stayed. And they said, yeah, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to come by and check this out. We want to see if it looks like this really happened. And you heard all these stories about artifacts that showed up here. What they actually did, they went out, and there was this homeless lady pushing a shopping cart on the street. And her name was uh, Joanne Simon. And they, they took the shopping cart and moved it in. And before the police and could come in and check it out, they just dumped it into the murder. And that's where, that's where all those objects came from. That's why nobody knows the, you know, where, where the origin is of any of them. It's because they just came from this homeless person they found on the street. And that's the real story of the murder. Wow. Yeah. Anybody else? Charlie, you must have something for us. <laughs> Sod. Oh. <laughs> Sod story. I wasn't there. All right. Okay. I might have to get help from you. You might have parts that I don't want. Oh, wait. We have to tell a story. Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> it's our shame. Come on. All right. <laughs> I paid my two hundred dollar fine. I've done my duty to society. Right. Yeah. Okay. Walter Muller. Who became that? 
I think, I think we were in the first. He came in and he said, guys, up here in Fort Washington, there's this whole pile of rolled up pieces of sod they're not using. They just put it out by their dumpster. They're throwing it away. What a shame. And so we thought, all right, I probably live there to take it into 10 to 50 and unroll the stuff onto the lab tables down in front and set up a few golf tees or something. All right, so so this is a hack waiting to happen. It's perfect. We got it good. So middle of the night, we gather up trash bags and my nice big new J Rat pack <laughs> with my idea. This is critical here. And we carry it down to Fort Washington and we start taking these big old rolls aside and stuffing them into these trash bags and garbage you know, and, and backpacks. Yep. Well, and little do we know that this is Fort Washington Park after all, and so there have been a lot of unsavory characters around, <laughs> and so the cops were actually watching this park. <laughs> so what they saw was what they thought was like the biggest drug bust ever, <laughs> or maybe some like thieves spreading, splitting up the spoils of all the houses they just robbed. Well, no, no, that comes later. So what we saw was this cruiser screaming across the parking lot towards them, the lights and sirens going, so we did the thing you're not supposed to do, which was you dropped everything and ran. <laughs> <laughs> we scattered. There were four of us. There was you and me, Micah, yep. and Walter Muller. And Walter. So, so no, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, uh, so I, I dropped everything, including the backpack with my idea. And I told you that I would run between the, uh, between the whatever building for the time, yep. into the parking lot over on Bastard Street, and I dive into the gravel under a car. And I hug the ground, and I pray, hopefully do not find me. Well, we call the more pop cars to get noisier and noisier. I don't know where you see. Okay, well, of course, because at this point, the cops are like, wow, and they're running, and there's a gang involved. <laughs> so, <laughs> And so, I, being a somewhat devious criminal, almost in training, I like take off my blue jacket and turn it inside out so I'm now wearing a white jacket. <laughs> <laughs> this allows me to get through the cordon of cops, at least as a far of Westgate, because I couldn't, I was worried, I should have tried to go for next house or something where they would have let me in. At the end, I'm like hanging out in the playground of Westgate. <laughs> the cops are just milling around, and one actually comes up and talks to me at first, and is like, what are you doing? And it's like, oh, I'm just in here, looking at the stars. And like, he goes away. <laughs> Later, he comes back and says, here, you're one of them. <laughs> I don't know if they ratted you out. Yeah. No, no one ratted me out. Um, okay. But it, it, I don't know how where they found Michelle. But the funny thing, of course, is Walter Mueller, who was the most identifiable one of us all, because he was, of course, wearing a spiked mohawk. <laughs> <laughs> so he manages to talk his way out. <laughs> so the the story that Walter told me. Yes. <laughs> Walter talking, so. But the story that Walter told me was that he ran a couple blocks and then turned around oh, and started walking, walking toward Fort Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and the cops here were like, "Well, he can't be one of these these criminals because why would he be walking toward the scene of the crime?" <laughs> and they're like, "Did you see any like unsavory characters running away?" Why no, officer? I didn't see anybody. He just kept walking. And that's so meanwhile, we are being arrested, like you know, handcuffed behind our backs being hauled so into a get, van and driven down. How did you get found? Um, they found me under the car. And at that point, I wasn't going to run anywhere because I thought, they have my ID. They knew who yeah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I might as well just come out and hope that I can be the innocent See, sophomore and not maybe get her up now. No, there. So did they I arrest you for transporting grass? Right. Oh, I have to So they, they've arrested the three of us in the... Um, the parking lot, which is now a building or something, the other side of the railroad tracks. And so the arresting officer is proudly leading us back over to the Fort Washington pickup. I think, or did they carry, no, no, they carried, so they didn't leave us over there. The police officer comes up carrying one of the bags, right? And our arresting officer is very proud, like, what was it? What were they doing? What did we get? <laughs> the guy with the trash bag, officer with the trash bag, opens it up, the arresting officer looks at it, and he looks at us, and he's like, oh, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so in the Cambridge lockup up in Central Square, um, I remember listening to them down the hall, and got, going through the book, uh, trying to figure out what to charge us for. And they came up with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> laughing their heads off. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they went to the judge the next morning. Well, okay, I didn't mean they, 
not quite sure, like, if they actually ever really intend to do anything other than scare us. There was a, uh, so, our one, eventually they decided to charge with larceny from a construction site, but our, our Pika friends, God bless you all, came down to try and bail us out in the middle of the night and actually brought, like, several hundred dollars in cash. And we're told, oh, the bail bonds person is not here. So, I will later find hundreds of dollars in my wallet. Because apparently that's where this money is going. But in case we maybe we needed it. But, um, and, 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 and uh, they never bothered to, like, photograph us, or, photograph us or fingerprint us or anything. So I'm not sure that we ever actually were technically really arrested or not. Well, okay, I'll tell you later. Okay, so, um. So, so they hold us before the judge next morning, and someone from the campus police is basically serving as our counsel. And he's, he's this nice, nice old guy. Just calm down. Everything's going to be fine. What you, what's going to happen is you're going to go before this judge, and he's going to yell at you, and he's going to humiliate you. Don't laugh. I'll <laughs> 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 just say, yes, sir. No, sir. Okay, sir. That does, don't, that, that's all you do. And, and then you will get off of this with nothing. Uh, which is uh, pretty much what happened. Which is what we happened. managed to keep a straight face. Yep. How, <laughs> you manage to keep a straight face? How, did, how did you manage? They were picturing him naked. Okay, the police officer did actually give us advice. It was a form of like, you know, bite your own tongue, dig your fingernails into your hands, whatever you have to do, but do not laugh. <laughs> so we were just being contrite. And so they, they let us off and slap on the wrist. We got a two hundred dollar fine. Uh, we had to write a letter to our parents. No, our parents had to write a letter explain to the judge explaining oh, what we had done. Right. Okay, so, yeah. okay. And wow. then they say, like, all right, then the case is going to be continued forever. It'll be stricken from your record, no problem. Um, now it turns out I went back a couple years ago to look. It has not been stricken from my record. <laughs> Nothing still shows up in my Cory checks when I have to work with kids. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> still shows. I'm sure everyone looks at that and kind of goes. <laughs> they don't care what happened, but it does show up. Uh, so they lie. Cops, this is my introduction to cops lie. Yes, uh, yes they, they do. It is um, but going back to the morning that we got out, we went back to the Cambridge lockup to pick up our stuff. All the bags, up my, my backpack in particular, because I really loved that jay and I really wanted it back. And I get in there, and they, they hand us the stuff over the counter. It still has the sign in it. <laughs> <laughs> and we asked them about it and they said, oh, that stuff? No, they're throwing that, they're trying to give that away to us. No, take it, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so criminal forfeiture did not apply and you get to keep the most valuable possession that uh, any piping can ever own. But what the hell is it's a $200 fine for? Wasting their time. Yeah. 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 That was the court fee or whatever they called it. One of the least successful hacks of all time. <laughs> 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 Leave it to Pike and the fail of the hack. I What is, to what's the current Danielle story on the list, Danielle? Yeah. What? What's the current story on the list? The alumnus? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's really good up until 2010. And I think I feel there's some missing people. I don't know that I can email the list to people because people, have, some people want privacy and then they get annoyed at me when I email the list out. Oh, okay. Uh, so I don't know if I should email the list. We have a gap from 2010 to 2015, and it's good from 2015 on. Um, so I need to work with the house on 2010 to 2015. Um, and, and figure out a way of emailing it, or, or at least getting it? It's just an it's just an Excel file. I don't do any fancy with databases. It's just Excel. I can email it to everybody. 
just I can see, keep a column with the list of people you don't want to be contacted. Yeah, unfortunately I don't find that out until I send out the alum list. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I get like 30 emails, how dare you give my information out! Um, so maybe, okay, I can send the alum list out. That would be great. <laughs> I'll send the alum list, and then it would help me. I would help. Yeah. 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 Thank you for coming. And this event is fantastic, and Pancakes was fantastic. And so all the side events, thank you all for that. Yay! Yay! So, I'm going to jump in with a quick commercial announcement for a side event. Um, this evening at 7 o'clock in Porter Square, there is a contra dance. And I'm taking anybody who is interested and anybody else who is not interested uh, up there to 7 o'clock. You learn to dance 7.30. We dance from 7.30 to 10. If you want to come, talk to me. I'm paying for all in-housers and all recent in-housers who Oh, that's so cool. Oh. Cool, may, So, may I say this concludes the first ever Murph Story Slam? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a hand for David for putting this yeah. together. It's a really nice yeah. job. Yeah. 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 We're going to move the video. So is is Will still here? Like Where's Will? Oh, Will. You can stand. Will, Irv, TJ, do you want to say something? I think, I think we should confer for a minute. I think we should confer. Okay. Where's Will? I'm here. Somebody okay. start the timing in a minute. Why don't right. we just go over in the corner? Will, okay. Will we get the story from a primary source? Just call it a tie. Come on. <laughs> Shut up. We're going to. Shut up. <laughs> well, while they're conferring, I can tell a non-Murph story. Non-Murph story. Non-Murph story. Filler non-Murph story. And this is, this, is one of the, this is one of the guilty parties, and there's another. And uh -oh. so during... during at the table before classes start, our freshman year, remember that? So these guys helpfully took us on a tunnel tour, and so you know we went down through the tombs of Building 13, and then, or over into Building 10, and and climbed down the the thing into the steam tunnel, and then we were going to come out on Vassar Street. Well, as we came out on Vassar Street, the cops were waiting. And they nabbed, you know, you and a couple, and, you know, Aaron and maybe Schaefer, I don't know. You know, they all came out and got nabbed, you know. And the rest of us kind of ran back. back. It's like, oh, no, there's only three of us. There's not ten. Okay. Okay, well, then I'll tell them to keep telling you. So anyway, <laughs> so the rest of us scurry back, and we thought, well, we'll go back out the, the, the pipe that goes up, you know, and come out. And, and there was a janitor waiting there, and he nabbed Steve and a couple of others. And who was left? It was you and me, and you, and maybe. Okay. Was this like Marky was in there, yeah. right? Was that Bell there? And no, no, I don't think it was like, Bell. But the point is, there were four. It was Aaron. Aaron was with us. There were four freshmen. We didn't know where we were. We didn't know <laughs> what was going on. We're in the steam tunnel. All of our upperclassmen have been taken from us. We didn't know where we are in the steam. Tunnel. And so we went out. The, you know, we went toward the south end of the thing. And but we thought we heard footsteps, so we ran back up and we hid under the pipes, you know, for a little while. And we decided, screw it, we just have to get out of here. And we went back up the, the stairway and I mean, the, the, the ladder and got out. And that and then Steve came back and got us, and everything was fine. That was our first. That was our first hack. That was our first hack. We hadn't even had a class yet. We'd already done a steam tub. Another wild success. Actually hazing of the freshmen. Yeah, whatever. We didn't care. Freshman week or something. It was right at the beginning. It was before classes. It was before classes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
So everybody knows what cow bag is, right? It was. It no. was a, oh, yeah, you, you know, know what, what that is. Oh, well, the, the old oh, restaurants, sometimes you still see them in restaurants. So it's, it's, it's a box containing a six gallon bag with milk. And there's this little weighted oh, yeah. lever thing that, that shuts off the squeeze. We yeah. used to have those here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hey, good job of catching up, Dave. The Salad de Puerto Rico. Thank you. Definitely. And it was on the October, the, the Saturday, or whatever, before Halloween. So we just had to go. And well, Lord, good time as any to screw off. We all had problem sets. So um, we <laughs> filled up the cow bag with water. Now, I, I, I took the foresight to fill it with warm water because I was going to use it as a, as a pillow when I'm watching the movie. If you want cold water, then your head freezes. So that was, that was <laughs> water pillows. They were popular. And originally, it was, it was, it was a I, was, I, I don't know about you, but I laugh at various times in Night of the Living Dead. This guy was really pissed off at me for laughing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, movie ends. Steve knew how to get, he's the only one who knew how to get up to the roof of the green. It used to be, in those days it was easy. In these days, I think it's impossible. Yeah, in those yeah. days, it was well, really it, easy. I'd say it wasn't easy then either, because there were some tricks that I, I don't yeah. remember what the process was, but we got up there. So, you know, roughly half of us uh, were, were uh, on the ground. Well, it was Jenny, Can I add to this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. My dad happened to be in town yeah. for some <laughs> business trip, and he stayed with us at Pica. We put him up in somebody's bed in some room. He did seem a little mystified about it. <laughs> no, he, he'd been here before, and he loved it, but this was a, he never stayed here. Okay. And he was in Boston for some, some business thing. And so, But he came to the house after at the end of the day to stay here, and I was chatting with him, and I told him we were going to go out to this midnight movie and didn't want to come with us, and he was like, oh, Sounds great, but I'm kind of tired. I'll probably just sleep. But he and I ended up hanging out and talking, and and then at some point Arnie came by, and it was time to go. What a movie! My, my dad was go. wide awake, so he said, "Okay," and he came with us. He walked with us to the salad of Puerto Rico, and he laughed with us through the movie. And he, and we all used to sit on the floor in the yeah, salad no watching the movies. He had no yeah, chairs, floor, yeah. and he was just he was my dad was great. He was just loving the whole thing with us. And then when we got to the cow drop part. The rest of us went over to Building 18, yeah, I think, on the, side of the building second 18. floor where you could see. Well, too. there are some people out on the grass. There's there's some people the, in the grass, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I think we started outside, and then we ran in when the cops came. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> now we're outside. Like, right? that, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. we didn't want them to catch us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we went, watched from Building 18. We watched for you all to come out. You, Steve, me, Tom Kavicki. Oh, that was all of us. No, he wasn't. Oh, okay. It was just us four at the top. Okay. okay. Yeah. But three of you were crying. No, I know. I, I, I forgot that. But I, was, I didn't want to do that because if the bag split, while we're watching the movie, that would be bad. Right, but that was the original plan. Was there was a cow of turtle milk? There was a cow bag of turtle milk. We were going to throw that off. Yeah, we, we hung it off a beam bridge, bridge so yeah. that it was yeah. Yeah. slingshots. Yeah. But never mind yeah. about that. Right. <laughs> so we, we, yeah. we, 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 get to, we get to the roof, and um, uh, we knew we only had a certain amount of time before the right. campus police, police which would come. Because, no, because, because you had timed it, right? You knew exactly how long well, no, you had, had once no, you tripped Yeah, but rumor had it you had some amount of time. <laughs> once you open this one door, it's it going to set an alarm off, so you, you want to get it out of there faster. So we're there, and I'm, 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 I got the bag, and the instant I let it go, the campus cop car drives <laughs> through the green door. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to watch it. I didn't have to watch it. And it was and it's weird because you know it goes and it just seems to flutter there for a long time and do nothing. And then, shit, come on, hit, we gotta go. And then bang! Wonderful explosion. Echoed up the up the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely, they, uh, they found the recuperation came up. Yeah. So then we're, we're so okay, let me just yeah. add from the, the yeah. perspective from the, from the ground. <laughs> from the perspective on the ground, it was like the very split second that they hit the ground was the moment the cops showed up. That's how it looked to us. <laughs> this is a relativity effect. I think so. <laughs> I think maybe Arnie saw them yeah. coming before we saw them. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because they came from the other side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, 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 drove, they drove from the from the Mim Drive side. They yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he saw them before yeah, we saw them. Right. But from the moment we saw them at the moment, like they arrived right at that spot, like right exactly at the split second that they hit the ground. And it made the loudest bang I have ever heard in my life. It was like, it was like cans or something. And it was like ear splitting. 
<laughs> and and somehow, I don't, it must have been like right after the cops left or something, but later on we went over and we, you could peel the little bits yeah, of it was, plastic it was bag off day. of the pavement and it was, you know, had the perfect impression of the pavement. And it was <laughs> I don't remember when we did that. But we watched and we, we, then we, you know, because the cops were there, we ran because we didn't want to get caught. We went up in the second floor of building 18 so we could watch. From there to see when you guys, you know, are they gonna get out? What's happening? Are they, are they gonna get caught? And we watched and we watched for the longest time, and nothing happened. Nobody came out. The cops were still in there. The cars were still there. Nothing was happening. So finally, we gave up and we started walking home slowly down Master Street. And we're walking and we're walking, and then later they caught up with us. And then you tell your part. So I know Tom and I, and you're running the stairs too, because the three of us are in crew. Yeah. And Steve took off somewhere else. The three of us ran yeah, down the later. stairs. I wanted to close the doors we'd open, as if that was important. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the National <laughs> Park Service. Oh, Even as you found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Room on a hat. That's right, right. Leave only footprints. So we, so we're running down. Now, up some, somewhere, I think it was around the eighth or the ninth floor, I'm coming around, yeah. and I heard this bang out of my ankle. Oh, I sprained the shit out of my ankle. So running down, so we were originally thinking of going down the basement. I kind of said, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so we come out the ground floor, yeah. and there's campus cop. And he's just hassling some Chinese guys. Right. That were going right. in to do research. <laughs> right. oh, yeah, right. No. Oh, right. <laughs> and then he turns to us and says, you been up on the roof? No. What are you doing? We're, we're, we're running stairs. We're in crew. And he says, at 3 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> oh, you're just dropping rocks. Dropping rocks. Drop rocks, rocks off right. the roof? That's right. No, no, no rocks. No. no. <laughs> so, uh, crew at 3 o'clock in the morning? And Kabiki opens his jacket and says, yeah, you want to smell us? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, get along with no, you. That's okay. And as he's kind of saying that, the elevator doors open, Steve walks out, we don't recognize him, he doesn't recognize us. <laughs> he, walks he just walks right up. Yeah. It's my right thing, thing to do, you it, know. Was, it, it was a near thing because I walk out and I'm a co-conspirator. You know? <laughs> and here's my three friends getting busted. I mean, you, you can't just walk on by. So the little exactly white guy on my shoulder, the little, little white guy on my shoulder is saying, no, you have to go turn yourselves in. It's like, no, officer, I'm with them. I did it also. <laughs> but the little red guy on this shoulder says, no, just walk on by. That's a really good thing. And I listen to the little red guy because that's how they pull it off. <laughs> So, so you are like the counterexample to the prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> You're not supposed to work that way, Steve. I hate the prisoner's dilemma. I'm pleased to just prove it. Take resistance. It's the resistance. Yeah. Right. You don't volunteer to get busted when all the rest are getting dragged off. You, you leave to continue the resistance. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Soak it in warm water, but I didn't want to wait. Well, you so, lost all your warm water. Well, yeah. <laughs> so I just, well, the, the stove was different. There was a, a stainless steel Real. countertop, yeah. and there was, there was a, an old mix master mixer on it. And uh, I just put a, took one of these old pots in the basement, put that on the stove, uh, filled that with water, and I just sat on the countertop with my foot in the, in the, uh, like a frog, just like a frog. Yeah, yeah. But the problem was that I didn't, some people knew this, I didn't. So I'm, I'm sitting there, uh, uh, my hands on the, on the countertop, and the instant I put my foot in the, in the water, I feels like electricity. <laughs> and pull it out. Whoa, what is this? So I took my hands off the countertop. That's okay. What's the countertop? And I'm like, what the hell is this? Well, the mix master is plugged in, and I tipped it over, and the rubber feeder are not there. 
turns out one of the the, 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 the thing was wired wrong. If you unplugged it and plugged it in the right, it didn't, didn't have, you know, no longer has the, the, the larger plug for the, for the grounded leaf. So if you plug it the other way, then the case is not it, it is grounded. So you plug it this way. So plug it in right and don't sit on a stove with your foot. <laughs> 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 the was a lot closer. The it was only about that far. Just in case you were thinking of doing that. Just in case you were thinking of doing that. Water. Was it like you were sitting you on the grill with your foot in the pot? <laughs> oh, no, that would have worked. That would have been, been fine. Yeah, been that makes, but it makes more sense now, yeah. And remember, the grill, the, 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 the counter was only like this far from the stove yeah. back then. Right. Because the stairway went down where the counter is now, and so it was, uh, the kitchen was that much smaller, and there's no island in the middle. It was just an open area in the middle with the same red cracked tile. <laughs> and I did go to the medical center and get crutches uh, yeah. Monday. It took a while to put that together. And, and, and I got it. So Arnie is the only person who has ever chased me with a live chainsaw. <laughs> okay. And I love him for it. It's great. You know, I was not unarmed. I had a fire extinguisher that's not completely. I was getting this on video. I was a really annoying freshman. I wasn't the most annoying freshman. Not the most. I, no, I wasn't not even the, most. the second fattest freshman. Second fattest yeah, freshman? Yeah, what did you second fattest freshman? Wow. You were probably the second fattest freshman, weren't you? I think it was Andrew. It had to be Andrew. It, was and, I think Andrew. Andrew. I think it had to be Andrew, but um, <laughs> we've lost the judges. I might have to wait. waiting patiently but for you to wrap up. So we, anyway, we, we set a ground rule, and the ground rule was that the only stories that actually count were the first stories. <laughs> Who was well, anyway, we were having a battle with the urchins, and that was when you had to walk with the with the. With oh yeah, the I, I, I had this, I had this thousand watt quartz globe that I got at that time, and the big, the big walk we had. If you lined it, it's not parabolic, but if you lined it with aluminum foil, and then we mounted the thing, it made a great spotlight. So the urchins were in the back, uh, so we were up up on the roof, and I was trying to find the urchins. Now, one thing I had, I had these these things were called jumping jacks. It looks like a package of, of firecrackers. But it had a hole in it. So what they do, they, they, they hit the ground and then they start spinning around, whizzing. So there's some urchins right in the back of a car. First they hit the car. But I threw this thing out at them, and he just looks at this, and then 20 of the firecracker things start spinning around, and that kind of cleared the back of it. At some point, Stu lit an M M60 and threw it like over the, the garages, and it went off right behind the garage. That also helped. Maybe that was a different thing. But anyway, so they ran off. And I still have a fire extinguisher that isn't exhausted. Well, you know, you have to completely exhaust them. Yeah. You know, and the urchins are gone. So what are you going to do with a partially used fire extinguisher that has to be exhausted? <laughs> you nail so 